are listening to the Star Lores Podcast. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Why you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? But I was going to Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Every space-faring civilization, it would seem, eventually develops a technology so awesome, so powerful, and so destructive that it poses an existential risk to the entire society, and the people of the galaxy far, far away are no exception. Superweapons were no strangers to the galaxy. Indeed, there had been many past iterations throughout history. The Starforge, Antimatter Bombs, Darth Vader's flagship The Executor, among others, were all such armaments which could end a battle in a single afternoon. But none of these could rival one of the most powerful weapons ever designed, with its planet-crushing might and nearly impenetrable hull. The Death Star stood head and shoulders above them all. The Death Star's Father The Sinar clan was a wealthy, politically connected, and secretive family who enjoyed a perch in high society for centuries within the Republic. Their company, Santh and Sinar Technologies, was an engineering firm that designed and constructed state-of-the-art weaponry and ships for the fleet. They also benefited from some of the most lucrative contracts within the Republic's military industrial complex, creating vast generational wealth. Born in 60 BBY, Ray Sinar would one day become the crown prince of the organization, which he was slated to inherit once his father, Nero, retired. The young man's path, however, would not be a linear one as he was far more adventurous and daring than his predecessors before him. Though his family frowned upon his proclivities, it was this temperament that would make him the most important Sinar to ever grace galactic history. Wraith was ambitious and highly competitive, and found the strictures of his upbringing constraining and not conducive to reaching his highest potential. As a young man, he left the family business to strike out on his own, to prove that he had what was required to be successful without being handed an empire on a silver plate. And this was a good bet, as he raised his own money to create a scouting firm mapping new star lanes and hyperspace routes. This helped him become an expert in space travel and propulsion. Within a few short years, Wraith, thanks to some legally murky escapades, became independently wealthy without the help of his father. He even went so far as to assume fake identities and getting jobs with competitors of his family's business, learning their trade secrets only to exploit them at a later date. After achieving what he set out to, he eventually returned to Santh Sinar Technologies 
and took a job in upper management. Leveraging all that he had learned in the years that he was gone, he headed up a department of the company that specialized in research and development, which was right in his wheelhouse. Here, Wraith focused heavily on developing new ion drives and cloaking technology. This work was done very covertly, under a cloud of secrecy, to avoid any Republic or industry secrets from leaking into the wrong hands. During his time in this role, he ran into another young upstart, similar in age, an officer in the Republic's Outland region's security forces, by the name of Wilhuff Tarkin. Wraith and Wilhuff were kindred spirits, both calculating and ambitious. Their friendship grew over the years, and in many ways they used each other to advance their own careers, as Sinar would leverage Tarkin for large Republic contracts, and Tarkin would in turn benefit from integrating his friend's new toys into the Republic's army, gaining him clout among the upper echelons of the military. During a yacht excursion, the senior Sinar, Nero, was executed in a botched assassination attempt intended for Wraith from enemies he had made in his past life. As a result of the death of his father, Wraith would take over the family business, where under his leadership, it would become very profitable and politically well-connected. A few years prior to the Naboo crisis, the business mogul would be approached by a shadowy figure requesting his services to build custom and often stealth ships, not the least of which was Darth Maul's vessel, the Scimitar. It was around this time that Wraith was mulling over one of his most ambitious ideas yet, what he called a, quote, expeditionary battle planetoid. The concept design for this was three spherical attachments, one large in the middle, with two poles extending from it on opposite sides, attached to two smaller spheres. Each sphere would be equipped with a massive turbo laser, not to be confused with the later iteration of the planet-destroying super laser. Sinar pitched the idea to a number of customers, including one of his biggest clients, the Trade Federation, with no success. The key drawback to building a ship of this scale was that at the time there was no propulsion system capable of transporting a ship of this magnitude with any speed worthy of a military vessel. Because of lack of market interest, he tabled the project indefinitely. A few years later, after Palpatine had seized control of the Republic and began its transformation into the Galactic Empire, Wraith had mentioned the idea to Tarkin, half expecting it to go nowhere. Wilhuff, however, was enamored with it, going so far as to present it personally to the Emperor himself. Though failed to mention that it was Sinar's design, thus taking credit for the idea himself. Palpatine agreed and promoted Tarkin to Moth so that he could oversee the construction of the vessel. With a few tweaks, rather than three spheres, they designed it to be one incredibly large sphere, the size of a small moon with an upgraded weapon, the super laser which had the capability to destroy planets. Tarkin envisioned it more as a symbol of fear and domination, rather than a tactical or strategic weapon. He wanted to strike terror in all those who dared oppose the Empire, going so far as to name it the Death Star. There was, however, still the problem of propulsion with such a large vehicle. The Moth employed his friend Wraith to spend as much resources as possible to develop hypermatter technology. Sinar seemed to be unperturbed by the fact that Wilhuff gave him no accolades for the idea. Perhaps he was satisfied just knowing that his once grandiose design would now become a reality, and expeditiously created a propulsion technology using hypermatter 
which was able to propel the Death Star across a galaxy in a fraction of the time it would have previously. Though the conceptual creator of the Death Star was hardly known in the annals of galactic history, preferring to lurk in the shadows, the impact of his engineering would be felt throughout the aeons. And to give credit where credit is due, much of the actual design work was done by engineer and architect Bevel Lemelisk. Specifications and Design The DS-1 Orbital Battle Station, colloquially referred to as the Death Star, was a technical masterpiece of terrifying might. It was the perhaps the most ambitious project that may have ever been attempted by any spacefaring civilization up to this point. From end to end, it measured 120 kilometers long. The trench in the center, which spanned the circumference of the craft, came in at a whopping 503 kilometers. The vessel was divided into 24 zones, 12 in each hemisphere, with a bridge in each zone that acted as a control center to help manage ship operations in its respective area. All of the zones were grouped into sectors, each of which served as a specific purpose as follows. General, Command, Military Security, Service, and Technical Sectors. It even had shopping malls, cantinas, and sports arenas. The space station was more than just a mere super weapon. It served as a naval base for resupply and repair, a center for government, and a mobile military HQ. The Death Star wasn't just a tool of mass destruction. It also served as an advanced tactical and strategic purpose. The propulsion of the vessel was also highly sophisticated and advanced. It was made up of 123 hyperdrives, that worked in concert to move from point A to point B. The energy created by the ion engines and its sheer mass produced its own gravitational pull that did not require the assistance of artificial gravity. The hypermatter reactor had a dual purpose, one in the ship's propulsion and a second in powering planet-crushing superlasers. Impressive as this was, every time the weapon was used, it would expend so much energy that it would take roughly 24 galactic standard hours to recharge before it could be used again. The vessel boasted a standing military of 265,000 soldiers and a crew of nearly 1 million. The super laser was not her only armament, as it was armed with over 15,000 capital ship turbo lasers and 700 tractor beams, which could work in concert together to tractor in ships as large as an Imperial Star Destroyer. It carried 7,000 TIE fighters, four strike cruisers, 20,000 transport vessels, and 11,000 combat ground vehicles. Despite the Death Star's impressive feats, it had one built-in design flaw, which made it fragile in an unsuspecting way. When it was created, the Imperial engineers that worked on it were only thinking of how it could resist larger bombardments of capital ships. As history would show, however, its primary vulnerability was a small opening on the surface of the station. Thermal exhaust ports were a necessary component of a ship that used as much intense energy for both weapons and propulsion as a Death Star did. They were two meter wide openings, which exhausted excess heat out of the interior of the vessel. Without them, engines and weapon systems would quickly get worn out and microprocessors would melt. The de designers of the DS-1 probably never thought that this would be a weakness believing that there would never be a pilot with the skill capable of firing a torpedo into such a small opening. But as Darth Vader once equipped to the military commander overseeing the construction, Don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerers. And in a prophetic way, the Dark Lord was exactly right. For indeed, it was the power of the Force that took down the Death Star when rebel legend Luke Skywalker used the Force to guide a torpedo fired from his X-Wing into a thermal exhaust port causing an explosive chain reaction inside of the vessel, ending in its obliteration. If at first you don't succeed...
Though the lifespan of the superweapon was relatively short, its impact was no less felt on the galaxy. With the destruction of Alderaan, the Death Star made its presence known and instilled fear upon the galactic community that had not been felt for many millennia. Palpatine had just dissolved the Republic Senate, consolidating his political and military power. It appeared as though the Galactic Empire was only just getting started with its reign of terror. This is why it was all the more surprising, if not shocking, to witness the explosion of DS-1 at the Battle of Yavin, in what appeared to be insurmountable odds against an unbeatable foe. Though its destruction was not the final nail in the coffin for the newly born Empire, it certainly dealt a political and economic blow that the Palpatine regime would never fully recover from. The event was so significant, it became history's demarcation point, now known as, quote, before the Battle of Yavin, or BBY, and after the Battle of Yavin, or ABY. With the annihilation of the space station, it turned the tide of the war with the rebellion, inspiring a new hope, giving them morale and motivating more star systems to join the cause as the Empire now looked weak and the Jedi, it was rumored, had returned. Despite the crushing defeat at the hands of Skywalker above Yavin, the Emperor would not be deterred. They regrouped and immediately began drawing up plans for a second Death Star. With experience at their back and many of the wrinkles worked out from the previous design, the Death Star 2 was constructed much faster and much larger than its predecessor. Coming in at 160 kilometers end to end, the ship was a behemoth. Though its layout was a carbon copy of the original, Beval Lemelesk, the architect that was previously mentioned as overseeing the construction of DS-1, was executed for failing to make their first attempt invincible. However, in true Palpatine style, Lemelesk would be cloned so that he could work on the resurrected Death Star, something of a poetic turn of events. In this iteration of the battle station, it no longer had the two meter wide exhaust ports instead opting to build millimeter-wide pinholes throughout the ship. Thousands of turbo laser lasers were added to its arsenal, and the new and improved super laser only took three minutes to recharge, not 24 hours, an order of magnitude improvement. The upgraded laser could also fire smaller, less powerful bursts in faster succession. This was ideal for destroying large enemy vessels. Despite being superior in almost every way, it would not be long before the Rebel Alliance caught wind of its construction and was able to locate it in the Endor system. The ship was being protected by a shield generator while building was still in process, with much of its core exposed, making it incredibly vul vulnerable if not for the shield. Through a series of events, the Alliance was able to locate the second Death Star neutralizing its shield on Endor and destroying the battle station, with yet again another torpedo fired into its core, once again foiling the Emperor's plot. Though they would go on for many decades to come as a much smaller power, these events sent the Empire into complete disarray, and it would be the final blow from which it would not recover, displacing them as the galactic hegemon. By destroying not one, but two Death Stars, the Rebel Alliance would now make its mark on the galaxy as the new superpower on the block. They would go on to start the New Republic, rebuilding in the Death Star's smoldering ashes. Try, try again. 
A Worldcraft is a very large, spherical space station designed to be a habitat for sentience, something like an artificial planet. It contained ecosystems, topography, animal and plant habitation, among other things. Because they were not military in nature, they were somewhat easier to build than a Death Star, and Palpatine commissioned a few of them during his reign, even gifting some to his top officials. One such Worldcraft, which was incomplete, was given to the aesthetic of the DS-1, with a fake hull to appear like the Empire's menacing jewel. It was called the Death Star III. It was designed to be a diversion, as Tarkin and Vader had discovered that the Rebel Alliance was frantically searching for the new Death Star to put Skywalker and crew off the scent for the real thing. When they eventually found the Death Star III, Rogue Squadron was able to make quick work of it by firing a torpedo in one of those blasted exhaust ports. The Empire's obsession with Death Stars did not end here, however. Palpatine had commissioned the construction of a prototype Death Star at the Mon Stellation. With an identical diameter, it carried no hull and was only a Duracell frame with a core and a super laser. The skeleton ship only required a skeleton crew, complement, and could be piloted by one officer. Its super laser, though powerful, was only capable of destroying smaller moons, as its beam could not penetrate a typical planet's core. It also had a faulty targeting system, making the weapon difficult to use in most circumstances. It was completed in three BBY, prior to completion of the first Death Star, and remained active until its destruction in 11 ABY, where it was led into a black hole and destroyed. Though there are no other known Death Star prototypes to exist, it is rumored that more were built this, however, is nothing more than hearsay. Another attempt at such a vehicle was by the power-hungry crime lord by the name of Durga the Hutt, as he was something of a fan of Imperial design ingenuity, and was inspired to create a superweapon of his own to use as a symbol of terror to control planets. In 12 ABY, he employed the services of Chief Death Star architect Bevel Lemelisk to build a ship that was made almost entirely a weapon without the huge crew requirements, turbo lasers, docking ports, or living quarters. It was simply a super laser attached to a cylindrical Duracell structure a few kilometers long, called Darksaber, not to be confused with the Darksaber that was a variation of the lightsaber. Durga's resources were nothing compared to what the Galactic Empire had, and despite employing Bevel, the other engineers who worked on the project were not the galaxy's best and brightest. The Darksaber was rushed, had shoddy workmanship, and was riddled with flaws and errors, many of its components needing to be rebuilt several times. This would not deter the hut to begin using the vessel to show off to other huts. Unfortunately for the crime lord, the weapon was discovered by Wedge Antilles and hunted down, proving to be no match for the small Republic fleet, as its poorly welded Duracell hull could not even withstand blaster fire from X-Wings. Realizing the ship was no match for Wedge and his fleet, Durga tried to escape into an asteroid field. In the retreat, they were confronted by two moons, which Durga attempted to fire the super laser at, but to no avail as the weapon malfunctioned, causing them to crash into the moons, destroying the Darksaber and the hut along with it. The Death Star Ethics In a war among the stars, military brinkmanship will always be a feature. In the fierce competition to dominate an enemy, swiftly and efficiently, the incentives to build weapons ever more deadly will always be at the fore. There are many rationales for this, creating what can appear to be a morally ambiguous situation. Though it may feel wrong at first glance to build such a terrifying device, there can be an argument for its existence. The primary one being is that often war is very long and difficult to win. The blood that is shed can fill oceans, and the resources expended can bankrupt even the healthiest of economies. This is true even in the case of much more powerful states invading weaker ones. This creates a moral reasoning where the creation of an all-powerful and devastating weapon 
can actually end wars much quicker, saving more lives in the long run on both sides and avoiding total economic catastrophe from a drawn-out conflict. One may wonder if the Death Star fit into this category, as the Republic had internal conflicts for millennia and had many long and brutal wars. One could envision that the reason to bring such an awesome force upon the galaxy was in fact to create a more peaceful one, to finally put an end to the bloodletting. Though the narrative arc of the galaxy far, far away might lead us to believe in a more black and white view of history, it is no less important to ponder these issues. Or perhaps these questions are best led to military ethicists and philosophers to debate for years to come. In this regard, we will let the listeners decide for themselves. Thanks for flying with us. Jordan here. Just wanted to let everyone know what's happening here at the Star Lords podcast. Star Lords is now on Discord. If you would like to join the Star Lords Cantina Discord server, you can find a link in the description or on any of our social media accounts. Reach out with a DM or email. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter by searching the Star Lores podcast. Go ahead and give our page a like and send us a message. You can also email at starlorespodcast at gmail.com. Send us your fan art, Star Wars collections, or fan fictions, and you may even get a feature on one of our pages or even the show. Don't be afraid to offer corrections or add to any of the topics that we discuss on the show. We are also on Patreon. So if you want to help us pay the bills, as well as get a few awesome perks like bonus episodes, access to the private Facebook group, or the VIP section of the Discord server, head on over to patreon.com forward slash star lores and sign up for as little as one US dollar a month. And finally, make sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher app or YouTube, as well as sending us a five-star review on iTunes. This really helps us reach a wider audience. Enjoy the rest of the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Millennial Falcon. This is Jordan. And this is Christian. So, Christian, let's uh, have a little moment for some Star Wars self-help, shall we? All right. (laughs) Uh, Everyone has their weaknesses. (laughs) And I always have to ask... What is your thermal exhaust port? <laughs> I was going to make a similar joke, and now I can. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I stole, I stole but it is my weakness. You're right. If I ever got a torpedo launched up there, I'd definitely feel it. Well, I meant it more metaphorically. Oh. But, <laughs> you know, like, do you have a drinking problem? Right. Yes, that's what you meant. Yeah. Uh, indeed, indeed. So the Death Star. Yeah. Here we are. The uh, the destroyer of planets, the eater of worlds. <laughs> um, some interesting things about the Death Star. So one thing that I didn't quite mention, there was actually a lot. There's a lot of material uh, on the Death Star, and probably you could go into it. And like characters like Beval Lemelisk, who was like one of the architects. I didn't go. He has a huge backstory, so people can can go into his story if they want. <coughs> Sorry, um, but that's that's one thing that I it would have just been too long of an episode to yeah. to have a whole biography on him. In classic well. Star Wars fashion, you have rabbit holes and yeah. rabbit holes <laughs> on rabbit holes, and that yeah. that's right. Yeah, so I sort of. And I'm sure there's going to be people upset that I kind of only gave him a couple passing mentions. Yeah. <laughs> and because he is kind of in like a lot of the books and comics, he is pretty important. Yeah. Um, and I gave sort of more of um, more of a profile to Wraith Sinar. 
but I just felt that was important thematically because he it was like his brainchild, yeah. the, the Death Star. So I kind of wanted to include that. Well, while we're talking about Wraith, um, something that's interesting and not to just jump into comparing and contrasting right away, but yeah. in Disney's canon, um, director Krennic, who's the main bad guy of Rogue One, yeah. has a very similar kind of um, relationship with Tarkin. That's and right, Tarkin's yeah. kind of taking credit for in Disney canon, Krennic's idea and in yeah, Star Wars Legends. Yeah. Um, wraiths. I, I will say though that like, yeah, Krennic is though like um, a subordinate to Tarkin, whereas that wasn't necessarily the case with Wraith and sure. And but it's still Tarkin stealing someone yeah, else's idea, making right. Tarkin look like you know, it's like the same character. You yeah. know, even even in in uh, uh, Disney Wars. Canon, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so they're on the same level. Well, yeah. at least like in terms of like, if they made a movie. Of legends of the original Death Star, then the equivalent of Dr. Krennic, Wraith, would be a main character. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, like, I think um, actually, uh, Lemelisk would probably be more similar to the character of um, Galen or so. Was that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so Lemelisk was like kind of the main architect. Now, Galen or so actually in, in the, um, in, in Disney Wars, he actually isn't like the primary creator of the Death Star. It's the super laser that he designed. So right. it's actually the weapon system. He wasn't like the brainchild of his the, whole design yeah, of, the, of yeah. the whole thing. But he was like the primary creator of the of um of um the super laser. And it is interesting contrasting him with Bevel Lemelisk if you kind of go into his story because Lemelisk is a little more of a uh, I guess cynical character, but also kind of weak need but will do anything to gain power and prestige you know uh so kind of interesting a, a contrasting to galen or or so who's um has like a lot of like deep regrets about uh designing this weapon you know and he he, he actually uh reminds me of oppenheimer yeah <laughs> you know i was literally gonna say that yeah, yeah. like uh, we kicked off the episode with the oppenheimer quote uh about uh creating the nuclear bomb and the manhattan project uh, as so, and and this was like the star wars equivalent of the manhattan project was creating the super laser so yeah yeah i that does kind of bother me a little bit um i guess we'll talk about it now sure the brinkmanship yeah. of star <laughs> wars and they introduce a whole sleuth of super weapons that are like better than the, the Death Star. That's and like right, yeah. this this accusation is both at Disney and at Legends. Yeah. Um, you know, you have like the Sun Crusher and stuff. So That's it's right, yeah. like the Death Star, it kind of diminishes what the Death Star was supposed to be, which like you said, is supposed to be this nuclear yeah, so, yeah, nuclear level threat. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they just like pile on the new the, the new heavy weapons until, yeah. you know, you have a whole arsenal of cheap uh knockoffs. Yeah. And I would say even in <clears throat> even in like a Knights of the Old Republic, you you have like Kreia and um uh Nihilus who can literally destroy all life in the universe, you know. Yeah. They're, they're like, they just keep up the, yeah, they the, have to the keep up yeah, yeah. <laughs> of how destructive because they've already done planet destructive, destroying, yeah. Then sun destroying and now yeah. <laughs> like universe destroying. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, I agree. Like it it I think on a lot of sci-fi properties, that is sort of. I think like, across, like in any property, you yeah. always have like a dark lord that will conquer your country and then conquer the world. Yeah, and, yeah. You, you always have to up the ante, which. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It can it can get a little ridiculous, but and kind of it is interesting though because that is. I'm also, looking at you, Marble. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> um, where did character dramas go? You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> where's a good story about a person just living there? No, okay. Um, just on the up and yanti though, there is an argument for for it. Uh, actually, I can't. I I want to say Pablo Hidalgo, but maybe someone else. Um, especially with the dark saber, um, which is also gets another interesting nod in Rogue One, uh, when they're flipping through a bunch of files when the rebels infiltrate um, the base on the planet. Yeah, I know, I know what you're yeah. talking about. But when the when the rebels infiltrate the place, she's yeah. like scrolling through a bunch of um, imperial records, and you see the dark saber project, yeah. which is kind of like a nod. I'm yeah. sure Disney Wars is going to take it and make it its own thing, but yeah. it is mentioned. Uh, but the the author of the dark saber in Legends 
um, was saying that like he wanted to play on the on the escalation and brinkmanship of super weapons and the proliferation of super weapons. And I was I read in his Wikipedia article where he says like this is the equivalent equivalent of like a nuclear weapon getting in the hands of like some third rate power. That's right. So like or like a terrorist a terrorist organization or, organization yeah. or yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> And then, like, okay, what happens when someone else gets a nuke, right? Which, yeah. in this case, was Durga the Hut, yeah, <laughs> right? This shoddy nuke. Yeah. Which, I mean, hey, if you build a a nuke in some terrorist outpost somewhere, who knows? But it, no, but it, I mean, it is like if you think like, like North Korea, yeah, they have nukes, but their capability to use yeah. those nukes are so limited, and, and it's, compared to other yeah, nations, yeah. So, to me, if I were to think of something of a contrast, that would be it. But, yeah. Which is a cool concept, and I do yeah. like that real world exploration. So I'm not knocking the idea yeah. of like, oh, you can't have any more super weapons or doomsday yeah. devices. I, I do think the super laser, though, if you think about it, it is like a nuclear weapon, and and like everyone's every military power from there on out is going to want to have have one, one and replicate that yeah. level of power. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Whether it's a Death Star necessarily, maybe not, but a super yeah. laser, I could definitely see like an argument to be made that you could keep doing like a super laser arms race it, it could come in all sorts of different forms you know right, yeah. yeah but yeah yeah i think definitely like really the super laser was it, it, the death star's like main ingenuity if you will yeah. like or invention it you know it was that's what ma- gave it its teeth so. yeah and and to be fair to you actually i like some of the breakdown that people might not realize about the Death Star is that it was as much a naval base as a super weapon too. Right, so yeah. all those extra things, you know, like malls and there's people living there. Imagine like a naval base in Hawaii yeah, yeah. or something, right? Like any mi- major military infrastructure, they have all these like civilian attaches that kind of like build on the infrastructure. You have a bunch of soldiers there. That means there's money to be spent, money to be made. Yeah. So you have inevitably this build on and like this planet moon size structure has all these other other uh, amenities yeah which also adds a different level of context <laughs> when you have a group of terrorists blow it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep um yeah anyways uh another thing i didn't like totally mention uh but it is important to note uh when when the alliance found uh, the second death star uh, that was actually part of Palpatine's plan. He wanted to lure the uh, the rebels out of hiding, and yeah. he wanted them to bring out their full fleet. Um, he just made a bad calculation, miscalculation, yeah, yeah. and uh, it it backfired on him. Right? Yeah. So, well, he says it right. Like he, it's a trap. Yeah. Yeah. The classic yeah. bar line, right? Because <laughs> they thought that the laser was inoperable. They thought it was still under construction. And yeah. It was fully That's operational. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's fully operational. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, another thing, um, there are different, differing sources on the specs of both Death Stars, uh, some claiming that the DS2 was over 900 kilometers end to end, um, which would actually like be bigger than even our moon, <laughs> uh, which I, I, I read end to end the moon's about, uh, over 500 kilometers, something like that. Um, so, uh, that would be absolutely massive. Uh, but, uh, and there was a book, uh, it was called something like, uh, it was written in 04. It was sort of an essential guidebook. It was the inside story of Star Wars, I think it was called. But it had like all sorts of um, x-ray graphs of like ships and cantinas. And, oh, yeah. And, I, I vaguely have memories. Yeah, of yeah. Like I this, think right? I, I remember it too, vaguely. But it was written in 04. I would have been in like high school yeah. or something then. You know? I love those cross-section yeah. books. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it claimed um, that uh, that the Death Star 2 was like 900 kilometers. Um, but that was like the only... But a lot of people think that that is like... That is the size of the Death Star. Right. But, but the, if you go to the um, <clears throat> Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels, which is written in 96 or 94, I think. Maybe 94. Someone can fact check me on that. But um, uh, which... To me, is a little closer to the the to the movies when they're written, um, and that was like the '90s was kind of the heyday of all that Star Wars material being written, uh, and the expanded universe and everything. And there, it says it was only 160 kilometers end to end, which seems a little more realistic. And it wasn't, 
and, and the first Death Star was 120 kilometers. So it's 40 kilometers. It's bigger, Different. but it's not yeah. like significant. Yeah, it's bigger. not yeah. like orders of magnitude bigger. So um, I, me, I'm going with the essential guide uh, to vehicles and vessels. I I think that's probably the more accurate uh, one. Number. Yeah. yeah, but I I couldn't find anything of like George Lucas making a claim a on confirmation. Uh, yeah, on the size of the Death Star. <laughs> Uh, again, maybe that's out there. If you know, let us know. Uh, yeah. And maybe we'll defer to like Lucas's. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lucas, if you're hearing us. <laughs> or should we? <laughs> Sometimes he, he could be contradictory. It's actually larger than the sun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he yeah. gets his one up on the uh, <laughs> yeah. star killer base. So, I mean, I'm open to debates about that if people want to debate it. But I, 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 I kind of go with the, the smaller figure. Um, I don't know if you had You typically do, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you shut your mouth. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would, I would agree with you. Okay. Yeah, it seems like more reasonable. Um, so also, the Death Star looks eerily similar to one of Saturn's moon called Mimas, uh, which has a giant crater in, in it and like a little sort of dot in the middle of that crater and where it sits on the axis of the moon is like where the super laser would have been you better the- shut up before the cia <laughs> yeah. shuts no. down our podcast <laughs> you know they're building a death star <laughs> yeah yeah but you, the funny thing is they never actually pictured it until 1980 oh so yeah a- so it was like after reverse <laughs> it was so yeah. Yeah, and like uh i guess the people at nasa it was the voyager that took a photo of it and the people at nasa were like oh it looks like a death star <laughs> synchronicity uh, yeah you can you can look up the the photos of it and it actually legitimately does it's kind of funny um <clears throat> anyways i thought that was a cool little out of world factoid another interesting out of world factoid um so in 2012 <laughs> a, a petition was submitted to the white house urging the government to build a real death star to stimulate economic growth as the u.s economy was still in a recession because it garnered uh, 25,000 signatures, the White House was actually obligated to file an official report on it. The report detailed that the Death Star would cost over 850 quadrillion U.S. dollars. Uh, uh, <coughs> and that was in 2012 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, take 833,000 years to complete. And there was a question if there was even enough steel on Earth to meet the demand. Um, thus crushing many Star Wars nerds' hopes and dreams forever. <laughs> I love that they had, they probably like hired a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> they probably spent so much the money, money just, just <laughs> to write the report. Like hundred thousand dollars. That's why this is impossible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is man. thrilling to, from every angle. I love it. <laughs> we almost got to do it again. <laughs> yeah. We got to get out of this new re- yeah. Oh, sorry. We're not in actually a recession. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I just, yeah, funny out of world uh, stuff. Also, you know, the Death Star again is another Star Wars cultural icon. Um, yeah, people very recognize recognizable. It just by seeing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, let's uh, move on to Disney Wars. The uh, <laughs> what's the word? The vandalism yeah. of <laughs> this iconic. <laughs> So they they just, they had to do it. Yeah, they, they just they couldn't help. They themselves. just needed their own Death Star that's bigger and better, and <laughs> yep, just makes no sense. Yeah, at all. So so what's a uh, Star Killer base? Death Star four, three, five, whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever number it would be. Yeah. So what are your thoughts? Star Killer base is, and to add more insult to injury is a planet that they've essentially hollowed out and turned into a battle station instead of building from the ground up. The planet they chose to desecrate is Ilum, um, (laughs) which for any Legends fans know that Ilum is the uh, place where a lot of the old Jedi used to harvest kyber crystals from. It was super rich in the crystals, which makes sense why the First Order would use it to build a battle station, a super laser that uses kyber crystals. Right. Um, that was also something that was added, I believe, in the Force Unleashed games for Legends, that the Death Star also used big kyber crystal lenses yeah. to power its super laser, which is kind of a, a cool addition. Cause, oh, that was you know, actually added adds, in Force I believe it was. That's oh, the first okay. time I remember coming across that thought. Maybe I it was did. earlier, but... 
Yeah, I did read that in the like even in the legends um, material. Yeah, that, that it's like legends canon. That yeah, and you can a, even smash them in the game, which is pretty cool. <laughs> like, they just shatter because it was like they were playing with physics and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> but anyways, back to Star Killer Base. Um, yeah, Star Killer Base. You know, they completely have to one up the Death Star, of course. So not yeah. only does it destroy a single planet with a blast, it can destroy a whole system of planets. Right. Planets. Yeah. <laughs> planets in other orbits so with one shot that makes literally no sense yeah so like thinking about this again though it looked cool visually and it the, makes the literally no sense <laughs> it, it i i can't understand like how without like using the force somehow like i don't understand how this is supposed to work yeah just like how they drop bombs in space <laughs> <laughs> at least i've heard arguments that are like I don't like your argument. I think it's a dumb argument, the fact that you have to make it up, but fine, I can accept it. But th this is like literally breaks yeah, it's, physics. It's, it's even a, f a further stretch. Yeah, where you can literally see multiple planets in different systems in yeah. one sky shot. Yeah, it, yeah, that's right. Yeah, system to system firing super weapon. And even it consuming suns like that, we kind of see that with the... Uh, star forge right it uses the energy of a sun but it doesn't drain it to nothing that's right it and then contain a, a, like a sun's energy like you could see people standing so close to the heat yeah. of the solar like energy being absorbed by the planet like it would just annihilate anyone standing that close it I, none of it makes sense and people don't really understand how much energy a sun has like even our sun which isn't even the yeah, biggest like a, biggest kind of sun that stars star that there is. Yeah, like it. it I, in a typical twenty four hour day, if we could harness all the energy of the sun that the solar rays that hit the Earth, if we could actually harness it, we could um, energize our entire planet for a whole year in one day. Like that's how much energy is protruding yeah. from the sun in just this little speck. Uh, that's in the sun's uh, direct path, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's hard for us to even wrap our mind around how much energy is in, in a sun. In a sun and yeah. a star, yeah. And then they just absorb it <laughs> yeah. and then hold <laughs> on to it and then just fire it. And it just, it, everything it's about like, it just, is just dumb. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that, the, like, of course, you know, we've said this before, our whole complaints with The Force Awakens being this mimicry of episode four. So, of course, they have to have their equivalent of a Death Star and, of course, they have to destroy it. And, of yeah. course, you know, it just, it's tired. It's, it is. It's, it, people even complained about there being a second Death Star in Return of the that's Jedi. That's right, yeah, yeah. Right, like, two was already stretching it. People are like, okay, like, yeah. Yeah, at least it's sort of different. It's incomplete. Yeah. It looks a little... I, I liked it, um, but... I can see how people would complain about it being like, like, oh, you can't be original. You have yeah. to just yeah. take it and then, and then also have to add your own, like, oh, and it's even better and it's even yeah. bigger. <laughs> it just, it's, it's garbage. It's a yeah. bad idea. <laughs> and also you factor in elements of like, okay, the first one was a huge loss. Building a second one is like probably a bad idea. Yeah. And then with the destruction of the second one, literally being the linchpin that destroyed your empire yeah yeah <laughs> you're gonna replicate that mistake a third time yeah it's so great but also the other thing that i i thought was kind of ridiculous about uh star killer base is again like so the first death star and i forgot to mention this but in the script uh, the first death star took 21 years to build like right. it, it took a long time to build and the second death star it was about three quarters finished, but that was four years. So maybe call it five or six years and it would have been completed. Uh, but that was like with, they had this whole industry, imperial yeah, industry infrastructure. And, and they, had, yeah. they had learned how to do it from the first one. But, but to build like, you know, the first one, it took them 21 years. Now you have like an empire that's really like, uh, uh, what it is is a small cult in a corner of the universe all of a sudden has like the resources and infrastructure and like the number <laughs> yeah. of workers and, and no one material that <laughs> like, all this is getting yeah none of it none of it makes sense if you give it any frame of thought like yeah. there's always you know i mean i can like suspension of disbelief yeah, i can but, suspend like, my disbelief but come on that's so far <laughs> yeah. so far yeah it, star killer base was it's sort of a 
just a ridiculous like <laughs> I was fuming by the time we got there in the movies I was sitting in my movie seat and I just remember seething and looking around at everyone else and no one else like picking up on what's going on I'm like I know how this movie's gonna end now I know what we just sat through we sat through a complete mockery of episode four yeah and I was just seething in my seat it, like yeah and obviously the death of Han Solo is this death of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Kenobi yeah I knew and I knew like I knew the minute that happened I was like, I will, we're gonna we'll kill. get to that film eventually and we'll review it and yeah. smash it down and and super laser it <laughs> <laughs> only so much I will say Rogue One their interpretation of Death Star and like watching it be completed was very cool and awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. And even it the way it shoots just like a fraction of its lasers oh, to just yeah, annihilate yeah. the city and the yeah. visual of like the dust and debris. Like that was cool. I like that. Yeah, so that's actually another kind of little discrepancy from the legends. It seemed to suggest, and I haven't like actually read the source material because I don't have the time, but it seemed to suggest that like the first Death Star was very like constrained in what it could actually do with the super laser. Mm. It only had one setting. And planet and, destroy, yeah, planet destroy, and it took forever to recharge. Yeah, and it took forever to recharge. Well, twenty four hours. Yeah, twenty four hours. And, and whereas in Rogue One, it could actually like it, it, it could fire uh, less powerful bursts, right? Yeah. And so I, I, that was a bit of a discrepancy. I don't know if it's that big of a deal, but um, yeah, it isn't. I definitely like what I really liked about Rogue One was just again, it was like the visuals of like what. I, uh, what the point of view was of someone on the planet getting yeah. shot by the Death Star. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, that was and you like, see it twice. You also yeah, see it on yeah. Scarif. That's, that's the right. Name of the yeah. Planet. Yeah. yeah. Scarif. Uh, yeah, that's right. And so that that was really cool, like going to the other end of it and, yeah. and watching it. Um, and like, yeah, watching like the earth turn into like waves, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, and they kind of slowed it down, you know. They whereas like the in the original movie, it's just like blast. Yeah, a few minutes, explosion. seconds, and Alderaan yeah. is gone. Yeah. yeah um, so, anyways, uh, I did like the interpretation of, of uh, the Death Star in yeah. Rogue One. I didn't mind it at all. Just our nod to Disney. Yeah, our <laughs> pound of blood sacrifice we have to give them. <laughs> um, some cool other little factoids around um, early versions of episode of Return of the Jedi Episode Six. Um, Instead of Endor, the initial plan was actually to make it being built around Kashyyyk. And instead of having Ewoks, it would have been Wookiees and using Wookiee slave labor to build the Death Star, which is a cool like incorporation because you see that Wookiee slave labor thing yeah, yeah, really yeah. in a bunch of other, uh, other elements of the Empire. So it would make sense that like, yeah. and it would give Kashyyyk, like it'd be cool to visit Kashyyyk. It would have been cool. It would have been a better ultimate fight to see, you know, that battle in episode two, three with the Wookiees and the CIS to see the Wookiees in action yeah. instead of Ewoks. And like, sure, a Wookiee, you could understand defeating stormtroopers rather than little teddy bears. Yeah. So I think <laughs> yeah. that that was a missed opportunity. Do you know what? Yeah, I almost think that would have been cooler, um, especially because I know Return of the Jedi at the time. Again, I love Return of the Jedi, but I think at the time it maybe wasn't received as well as uh, the first two films. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Anyone that was I know like I know like in terms of ratings and stuff like the first two are rated much higher. Much higher. Than, yeah. Uh, the there are definitely some big missteps with Return of the Jedi. Yeah. yeah. But that yeah, I I definitely think having like a, a bunch of Wookiees and Yeah, I'm just like behind. mentally picturing like yeah. how cool the final battle would have been. Yeah, yeah, totally. And again, more understandable yeah. for the Empire to actually like be on the back foot. Yeah. Um a kind of out of universe thing any clerks fans out there? Um, there's a bit of a discussion that they have about, and I kind of made a joke alluding to this earlier about like all the civilian casualties that would have been implied with the destruction of at least a second Death Star because it's a giant construction site. That's Essentially, right, yeah. you'd have all these like non-military personnel building it that right, would have died yeah. in the blast. And presumably now with the knowledge of there being full-on malls in the first yeah. Death Star <laughs> who all would have died in the blast as well. Um, apparently, George Lucas, having watched Clerks, actually sort of responded to that. <laughs> so that scene where Dooku whips out the schematics of the Death Star in episode two yeah, uh, on Geonosis, Lucas's kind of like response was that like, well, Geonosians would have been building it, so it's okay to annihilate them because they're pretty much cockroaches or bugs. I forget what he calls them. Parasite? No. Something like implying that Geonosians are like <laughs> sub sentient creatures, which is also funny because they're also not. So... <laughs> So, yeah, layers and layers of, was it an act of terror? <laughs> yeah. 
It's but true. It's true. There's also a really cool fan art. Um, and the idea of like some stormtroopers that would have had their friends on the battle station who died, who would now be like hardened against the rebellion that much more like, Oh, you killed my friends on this battle station. And there's a really cool fan art. That's like a stormtrooper with his gloves off and he's kind of got his head down, like in a sad kind of image. And he's got a tattoo of the death star Hmm. on his, on his wrist or on his hand. And I forget what it says, something about like rest in peace or something like that. Oh, okay. It's so like that implication of like, there were real people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Not just faceless stormtroopers. Uh, I mean, I, not that I've read any of this, but you could imagine like even people's families would be on the Death Star with them. It's right? possible. People live on military bases with their spouses. Yeah, that's kids, right. So. Yeah. Like it, it's not like inconceivable that that, you know, it, it, Maybe in some of the other extra material they have written about that, it's hard to say. But yeah. yeah, it is like an interesting thought experiment to think about. And yeah, it plays into the question of like collateral damage and super weapons, right? Like, yeah, yeah the Death Star is a planet destroying threat, so we still need to take it out at the cost of these civilian casualties, yeah. right? Yeah. And same thing when you drop a nuke on Nagasaki, for example. Like, yeah. what is the real cost? What are we, yeah, what lines are we actually crossing in both directions when we destroy this and when? You know, yeah and that segue is nice i wanted to touch it briefly again I, I we mentioned it in the scripted portion but just like the ethics of super weapons and um it i it's definitely like uh can be very murky i know like a lot of people feel as though the um uh, the nuclear bombs that were dropped on hiroshima and nagasaki uh were were justified and necessary to end the war. Uh, perhaps it's all I, I always say with those things, it's hard to say because you don't have an alternate universe where you don't do that and, and you can test it <laughs> and, and actually see, right? Like we're always talking, we have to talk in counterfactuals and, and like, so, you know, maybe, but yeah, alternative history is always goes into like, yeah, <laughs> there's no way to know. There's no way to prove That's right, what yeah. other people would have done. You know, you can't even do that for your own daily life, let alone, yeah, you know, thousands of people yeah years ago yeah yeah and kind of another <clears throat> thought i kind of had <clears throat> sorry if you were to um if we were to play the uh empire did nothing wrong <laughs> devil, <laughs> <laughs> devil's advocate position <clears throat> you know the the republic at the time was like a pretty decrepit um uh corrupt organization and they had had like lots of brutal, brutal wars throughout its history and there had been lots of death. And like one could argue that had Palpatine been successful in just destroying a couple planets and, and everyone else would get in line. Yeah. And everyone else yeah. like stepped in line, which was his <laughs> stated plan. Yeah. 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 It's not like he wanted to go and destroy the whole like, universe. universe. And it makes no sense to turn that it weapon would, on your own. Yeah. Empire. That's right. Yeah. As long as people obeyed. Yeah, but he, he sort of had to send a message that like uh um like any kind of major resistance wouldn't be tolerated, right? Yeah. And and so but and again it, there's also like the the fan theory of uh he was just preparing for the Yuzhan the, Vong. Yeah, that's <laughs> the Sidious gambit. Yeah, is, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so if he was, yeah. you, you could say the Death Star was gonna be like one of their uh, best Ace weapons holes, against yeah. uh, against the use on yeah, an existential right? threat. Yeah, <clears throat> but I don't know. Just some. Just some that's like on. arguing like if aliens were to attack Earth, <laughs> yeah. we need our nukes to take on the aliens. That's true. Yeah, <clears throat> but, but there's um, no guarantee we won't turn them on each other. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but I do think it is like there's definitely a lot of tricky ethical implications about building super weapons of that magnitude. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, well, an armed society is a peaceful society. <laughs> That's true. So, but how armed, armed is <laughs> exactly? Do you want your neighbor having yeah. a nuke? We all just need a tactical nuke. Yeah, so there that. you go. We're all in this constant state <laughs> of uh, yeah mutually assured destruction. destruction. Yeah. All right. On that note, um, before we head out, we just want to give a big shout out to all of our uh, new patrons um, that we've had in the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, Xavier, Henry James, and Spark Industries. So mm. I hope Spark Industries is very wealthy and <laughs> sponsor us. Maybe we can build our own super laser. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, for only eight hundred fifty quadrillion dollars. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> we just need a few more patrons. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we just want to thank everyone. Uh, that's uh, a big help that helps us inspire us to keep going and uh, keep working on the show to try and make it a little bit better every time. Um, also wanted to give a bit of an update on how we're structuring uh, page, our patron. Uh, prior to, to it, we had a bit of a diff- kind of tiered pay structure. Um, but really, I think what we want to go to now, uh, we're going towards more of just a membership model. So uh, in the membership just gets you access to like the exclusive groups and the, the bonus content that's behind the paywall. Uh, we're asking for just $3 a month on Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash Star Lores. Um, so just uh, $3 a month. <clears throat> we have added on either side of that, a $5 and a $1, but that's, you'll get the same benefits. It's just, we're adding the $5 for people who, if you're feeling a little more yeah, generous, if you're feeling more generous. You want to support you really the, like show. the show. And, yeah. You know, it goes a long way. Like definitely we, Jordan yeah. and I both work multiple jobs. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is really more our spare time that we're uh-huh. donating and we really want to uh, be able to keep doing it right yeah. it is it is a lot of work yeah even just to be able to like cover our costs is like a great thing yeah. you know uh so so that we can uh keep going anyways um so the five dollar tiers if you're feeling a little more generous it's not going to change any of the benefits again we're just asking for three dollars a month for membership benefit <clears throat> And I did put a one dollar if you are struggling or you know you're having a hard time and you know you can't always spare you know one dollar um, is like almost nothing. So we want to try and make it as accessible to as many people as possible. So if all you can do is one dollar, not a we'd appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll still take it. Um, uh, but yeah, we're just asking three dollars for patrons. That basically makes you a member of the sort of exclusive content and and uh, the inside groups. So on um, on uh, Facebook and Discord, it seems like Discord's probably a little more active. Yeah, than, Facebook has definitely not been as active. Yeah. That's I guess Facebook's kind of a boomer platform <laughs> <laughs> these days. Yeah, but <clears throat> in any case, um, you guys. Always, uh, re- also, just reach out to us if you have questions, um, comments, criticisms, yeah, all of that. Uh, you can email uh, us at starlorespodcast at gmail dot com, or you can DM us on any of our social medias: uh, Discord, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Um, in any case, uh, I think that's it. Uh, anything else you want to add, Christian? No, we'll uh, see you guys next time. Peace. Yeah.